Okay. So uh, it is with pleasure that I'm introducing our guest speaker today, uh, Miranda Lesperance. Miranda is an Anishinaabewak uh, Ojibwe woman from Opwaganising Red Rock First Nation in Ontario, Canada. She is a PhD candidate at the Dalalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. Her research interests include Indigenous people's health, health labels and behaviors, and the social determinants of health. She has worked with the Public Health Agency of Canada for over 14 years, and most recently she was a researcher at the First Nations Information Governance Centre, working with COVID-19 data access and stewardship. After 15 years in Toronto, Miranda has recently returned home to the Thunder Bay region to complete her PhD research titled, We Are Stories, Not Labels, Anishinaabewek Child Rearing Experiences. After lecturing at Lakehead University, she spends as much time as possible at her home on Oliver Lake with her partner and her two children, Noden and Wasaya. So please help me welcome Miranda. And I should say Miranda uh, worked actually when uh, she worked with FACS, she worked with CAPS CCPMP and Aboriginal Head Start. So she's very familiar with our programs and the work that we do. And uh, we miss her dearly, but we know she's out there doing really important work as well. So welcome Miranda. Miigwech Blanca. Uh, yeah, I was going to, when you were introducing all of you, I do recognize some of the names because I was, yeah, I was a program consultant at FAC for those 14 years, um, initially with Aboriginal Head Start in urban and northern communities. And then right before um, I left on my education leave, I did have some CAP CCPMP, CAP CCPMP projects. And I actually recognize some of your names. I worked with um, up in Bruce County, right? So um, that was Mary Lynn, right? Mary Lynn Houston. So I don't know if she remembers me because I think I did one site visit before I was able, I, I went on my education leave. But um, that's an aside, I'm gonna start sharing my screen so you can see my presentation. Um, don't mind my, my messy, <laughs> my messy uh, dashboard here. It's a little, uh, it's a little uh, messy. My husband asks me all the time, like, how do you find anything? But I guess I just, it's a method to my own madness, I guess. Um, I'm going to, I'm in the wrong thing here. I'm not sure if I'll be able to monitor the chat with this open, but we'll see how this will work. So if you want to be able to jump in and ask questions, I totally welcome that for sure. That would be helpful. Okay, I can see it. There we go. There you go. Mary Lynn does remember me. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you for having me today because I, like as Blancas said, they miss me. I actually really miss being there too. I was actually looking at real estate again back in Toronto. <laughs> as much as I love being home and closer to my family, um, it's also, maybe it's the pandemic. I think maybe the pandemic is like two years later as, as they were saying that it was going to be two weeks at the beginning and then it became this, I don't know, maybe it's I'm just locked, locked in my house for a little while, but um, okay. So I was asked to talk today, um, which has worked really well because I was actually working on a book chapter with some of the, the material and the data that came out of the, the research that I've been working on for the last two years. And it's actually looking at Anishinaabe Kwe resiliency. Um, although I'll, I'll mention a little bit later, although a lot of the people that I worked with didn't actually like to be called resilient, but I'll mention that a little bit later. Um, so it really fits with the theme for your conference uh, this uh, season, I guess. Um, resiliency, adapting, learning, and growing. So I can talk about, about that bookshop a little bit later as well, too. So I'm Miranda Lesperance. That's my English name. As mentioned, I'm a PhD candidate at U of T. Um, I started before I moved back here. And one of my research partners is my home community of Apogwinistang, uh, Red Rock First Nation. And my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Okay, and um, a land acknowledgement was shared earlier and I appreciate that, miigwech. Um, and I also wanted to acknowledge that too to the traditional and current custodians of the land and waters that we share on today. Though we're in all in different areas. Um, I wanted to reflect on that. I wanted to say thank you to Sydney for inviting me in the CAT CPNP Ontario Network and FAC. Okay, 
So I'm going to launch into the self-location of things. So I'm going to introduce myself in the language. And as Bojo, Iju Chago Oji Chago Bisha Nadishnaka, Sapagwanisning Nadonjiba, Nibing Ninda, Mayinga Nadodem. So what I just said to you is that, hello, um, my spirit name is related to reflections in the water, which is why I have this picture of the sleeping giant here. So those of you in Thunder Bay um, would recognize uh, that land formation there, that ancestor. Um, and yeah, I just chose that picture that I took because it was uh, it, a visual representation of my spirit name, I guess. And as mentioned, I'm from a Pogwanisening, which translates to Pipestone red pipestone and it's the community itself in English is Red Rock First Nation and it's on the Lake Helen Reserve which is just outside of Nipigon, Ontario and Nipigon is um, about an hour away from Thunder Bay. Uh, Nibing is where I currently live now as mentioned uh, we have a place here on Oliver Lake we live out here full time now because of the pandemic and yeah we've been enjoying it and we've had some outdoor space to be able to go out and about during the pandemic but it's been good that way. Um, and my clan, I belong to the wolf clan. Okay. So I wanted to provide a little bit of outline what I wanted to talk to you about today, just to, um, yeah, just to let you know where I'm going and headed and all that. I, I appreciate that when people offer this because I do have a little bit of a, uh, require some accommodation sometimes. So I like to provide this. So I want to situate myself within the Anishinaabe or the Ojibwe concepts and the connection to land, my connection to my ancestors, the principle of seven generations. And then I wanted to launch into the strength-based strength -based approaches that came out of the research um, and working with the women at Red Rock First Nation. Research descriptions, strength-based me strength methodology, and the emergent themes that came out. Okay, I like to put this disclaimer in. Um, it looks like the group today is mostly uh, working all with Indigenous projects, so I think a lot of you will understand this disclaimer, but I do a lot of talks where I have to include this because um, not many people are aware that it's Indigeneity, it's not like pan-Indigeneity, right? So um, my teachings are very specific to um, the Anishinaabe Nation, specific to the Ojibwe, and specifically to my home community of Red Rock First Nation, right? So it doesn't represent Anishinaabe people as a whole. And it only represents what I'm permitted to share. Um, not only from a research standpoint um, and an academic research standpoint, right? Where we have to adhere to things like the OCAT principle and um, uh, thinking about research ethics, right? And that sort of thing, but also from Anishinaabe relational ethics where I'm not gonna share something that I was asked not to share or a story that doesn't belong to me. Okay, so just gonna have a little drink really cold in my office today. So I have this fan blowing at me so that I feel like it's just drying things out. Um, okay, so Anishinaabe Yaki. So this tra translates to Anishinaabe land. And I wanna talk a little about why it's important to situ my, situate myself with the land, right? So in my teachings, uh, we're very specific to where our land base is and where, um, because land is our kin, right? It's considered one of our relations. So it's very important that I tie myself back to this land when I do my introductions to people. Um, so I don't know if I can, I have to move this little around to show you. So this is a, a map that we have here. And this is from the Union of Ontario Indians. Um, my First Nation is actually, um, an independent of any tribal councils or anything like that, but they are affiliated with the Union of Ontario Indians. Okay, so if you see here, um, up here in the northern part of Lake Superior, uh, you see Red Rock, Lake Helen in brackets, right? So that's my little community where I came from. I grew up there until um, I was about 19, I guess, when I moved to Thunder Bay to attend Lake Lakehead University for my undergrad. Uh, at the time, it was a really big move. And yeah, to move back and move into a city, particularly where the city where the relations, relations with Indigenous peoples aren't the greatest. So it was a little bit of a, a culture shock, I think, moving from, although my community is like accessible, right, by roads and that sort of thing. Um, it's not uh, fly in a community like from up north, but it definitely was very different because my community has about 300 people living on, on the landmass and um, about 2,000 people in whole. 
Okay, and this is the treaty that we belong to, the Robinson Superior Treaty. And again, this is a retrieve from my First Nations uh, website here. So you can see it and where Thunder Bay is and Fort William First Nation, all signatories for this treaty. Okay, and then this is actually um, the waters where Lake Helen, right? So where my First Nation is located, right on Lake Helen, which is just below Lake Nipigon and um, the Nipigon River. So this is the view you see from my grandmother's house. So my grandmother, well, one grandmother's house is like just from this location. If you go a little bit to the right, that's my other grandmother's house. And you see this mission church and this mission church was um, established by uh, the Catholic Jesuits um, back in the early uh, 1700s. Still standing today, um, but they don't offer any services or anything like that. But a lot of people still utilize it for burial and that sort of thing there. Um, oh, I see a chat pop up. I'm just gonna take a look. It is, it is very beautiful. I actually, um, that made my decision to move back here was to stay on the water, right? So that's why we live here where this is Oliver Lake. Um, I'm trying to find some historical records because I've been, I was able to access some archival pieces generally for the area and for Red Rock First Nation. So I'm trying to find out like anything related to this back before, um, what this place was called prior to uh, colonization, for example. And uh, yeah, so this is what it looks like in the winter and that's what it looks like in the summer. And right now it's very snowy. <laughs> so I don't really see anything out my window. Um, I don't see it. Okay, so I wanna talk about this, situ um, situating myself with the ancestors. So any Kobijigan, uh, that is the Anishinaabe Muin word for um, ancestors. And it's important for me to situate myself with the ancestors because if I were to introduce myself to somebody um, within the Indigenous community, they may ask me who my grandparents are, or they may ask me where my community is, right? And um, so this would be my response to them. So my Annie Kobe again, so my ancestor, my great grandparents. So this woman that you see on the left with the glasses, that is my um, mother's great grandmother. And um, she actually were very literal. So I, I think I mentioned this before, if you've been in my, I think I did a learning session for CAPC CPMP back in last June, I believe. So you may recognize these photos, but this is uh, my blind granny. Um, she unfortunately went blind. And because we're very literal and descriptive in the language, uh, she was referred to as blind granny from then on. And then this woman here is um, also my, my mother's great grandmother. And um, she is uh, from her grandfather's mother. So these two, these two here are my ancestors, um, the matrilineal water line that I come from. Again, these are actually my great grandparents. So these women were my great great grandparents and these, these are my great grandmothers. So this is Marie Wawie here on the left. Um, and she is my, on my maternal side and this woman here, in the camel coat, I know it's a great black and white photo, but you can tell she's in a lighter coat. That is my grandmother on my father's side. So that is Lucy. And that's her husband, Denis, right there. <laughs> uh, my family always jokes because they're actually married, but they're standing very far apart from each other. And that's Denis' brother, Victor. Um, a lot of my family, so my dad's side of my family, I should mention too, if you those of you closer to Thunder Bay, they are from, um, BZA, which is Rocky Bay First Nation, right? So that's on the other side, sort of up on Lake Nipigon. And then I also have my dad's family in uh, um, Gull Bay on the other side of the lake as well. KZA. Okay, so these are my Nokomisuk. So my Nokomis is singular and Nokomisuk is a plural version of my grandmother's. So the woman on the left is my um, Dolores Marceau and she is my mom's mom. And she raised me actually. So I lived with her for a good portion of my life when I was smaller. And then again, in high school, she lived, I lived with her again and she was the education counselor for Red Rock First Nation. So she would ensure that I would be driving. To, she would drive me to school every day, high school. I wouldn't, wouldn't be able to miss it <laughs> because she was there and she was the one, she's part of the reason why I'm doing this PhD because she really wanted me to, um, she really believed in post-secondary education. So that's why. And this woman here on the right is um, my dad's mom, Shirley Lesperance. And uh, yeah, she was my mama. And 
Uh, both of them have passed away. So they are gone to the spirit realm at this point. Um, my mom, so ni mama, my mom and my dad, uh, the day day. And uh, so, yeah, I don't know when this picture was taken, but yeah, they both look a little bit different now, but my mom has been actually, she uh, has retired, but she was with FNIB. She worked with FNIB um, ever since I was a kid um, with programming there. And my dad was with Environment Canada afterwards. Um, they did go back to school when I was when I was a kid. So prior to that, like I think our lives sort of changed. I think after um, they did do that. Okay, Nishwashle, Nindanagol Bijaganon. So that you can actually see Anakol Bijagan in that word. So again, that means ancestor. But this translates to seventh generation principle. Now, this is what I talk about why it's important to do the work that I do. Even when I was back like at FAC and when I was working with programmings and that sort of thing, um, I always use this principle in my everyday life, which means um, that for every decision that I'm thinking about of doing or what I'm going to do, what I'm gonna make, I think about the next um, generations, right? So I think about my own kids, but I also think about generations into the future. So if you go back here, like these women who were my great great grandparents were actually thinking about my children here, right? When they were making decisions about things. So um, this is my son, Noden. We mentioned, uh, Blanca mentioned it in, in my introduction. So go with this, this is my son. And this is a picture when he was a baby. And this picture was actually taken um, by La Leche Lake. So I guess uh, it was mentioned, Mary Lynn had mentioned La Leche Lake and they had asked me, uh, they greatly helped me with my breastfeeding journey when he was first born. And then they had asked me to participate in a, in a campaign. So this was like an official photo that they took as part of this commercial work. And um, yeah, and he's always been this little chunky baby. <laughs> and this is my daughter, Nindonis Wasea. Um, she was born in Toronto and we actually used the seven, gener seven generations midwifery practice there. So that was very helpful. Um, to have them assist with her birth at uh, Sunnybrook. This is what they look like today. Um, they always like, they talk to me and they're like, why do you show our baby pictures? And <laughs> um, so they wanted me to put in a photo of what they look like today. So there they are, the two of them, they're goofing around. After this picture, the first picture of this was very serious. And then there was this picture and the next picture was say I tried to lick him. And then, so he's trying to pull away, but they didn't want me to share that photo. Okay, so I'm just gonna do, talk a little bit about the PhD research a little bit. So initially, okay, so it's called We Are Stories Not Labels and Nishinaabe Kwe Child Rearing Experiences. So this title has morphed um, many different times, but this is the, the, the title that we're sticking with. The We Are Stories Not Labels was actually gifted to me um, from my Annie Kobijigan Council. So that was one of the methods that I, I think I talked about it a little bit later, um, my methodology. And um, I established a council of um, aunties and grandmothers from the community so that they could help uh, guide this research, I guess, in a good way, because I, research is not generally um, looked favorably upon in the Indigenous uh, communities because we've been over research for so long. Researchers, non-Indigenous researchers would come into the community and um, sort of mine information and then leave and nobody would really know what happened with that data, right? So. Um, I've established this committee to help me uh, guide this to maintain a uh, connection to Anishinaabe protocols and that's, and they've been very helpful. And when I explained the, the theory that was given to me by Dalona School of Public Health to them, that was their response to this theory was that we're not, we're not actually labels. So I'll talk like, it'll make sense a little bit more when I get to what labeling theory actually is, but they wanted to ensure that um, labels, what they wanted to say was that labels are a pinpoint in time. So when a parent is labeled, it's not necessarily reflective of their whole experience, which is their story, right? So yeah, so that's how that's, uh, that title came to be. Um, so this is a quick introduction to the research and it may be a recap for those of you who are here in June as well. So again, there's the title. The research partner is a Pogwinist name. Red Rock Indian Pen is their um, registered name, I guess. Um, and then they're often referred to as RIB as their acronym. So the population that I worked with were female identifying members of RRIB. And this 
sort of evolved as well too, because initially we were gonna just focus with mothers. And then we realized with the San Diego Bijigan Council was that um, we didn't want to exclude any people who identified as female, right? And um, also were providing care to children and weren't necessarily their biological parents. So we have a number of uh, custom adoptions or kinship adoptions in the community, um, which are adoptions that are done. So family members will um, foster or adopt um, children uh, from other family members, right? And um, a lot of times it's not legal as well. Like it may not necessarily be illegal, but it's a family sort of thing. Like, a, I don't know, a tradition, I guess, or a custom. Right. So we didn't want to exclude any of those people who are caregiving for their grandchildren or from other members of their family. So that became more broad for sure. Um, the theory that was involved in the research was the labeling theory. So with that, um, initially, I wanted to just solely do Indigenous praxis, which is, I guess, the name itself, like praxis relates to practice. And when you're looking at things in, from an academic lens, a lot of the people within the U of T, because it's a very colonial institution, um, really questioned the use of Indigenous praxis because for Indigenous or for academic groups, um, a lot of times they like to separate things into like neat little parcels of things, right? So they wanted to really separate theory and they really want to separate practice. So this is sort of how they, um, how I was given this theory, I guess, about labeling theory, because to them, it was a very critical social theory that could be utilized. And honestly, it does, it does well align with what I'm looking at. It hasn't been used in health research prior to this. Um, well, I guess I shouldn't say it hasn't been, but it hasn't been extensively used. It was initially developed for um, like corrections, I believe in the legal systems. And um, yeah, and that's initially was developed and it's been used elsewhere, but it sort of like had dips in popularity from over time. Now the methodology. So I really wanted to use indigenous research methods, which includes that praxis, right? Um, so that included things like collecting stories and story work, conversational methods. So it wouldn't be like a typical interview where I'd come in with a list of questions and um, everybody would be receiving the same sort of questions. I wanted it to be more organic and just have a conversation with these women that would be talking with me, right? And then I'm working with the Anico Bijigan Council to come up with these themes that I'm presenting with you today. Um, yeah, so they were able to help me like work through the data and um, we were able to show them um, virtually because like, as you said, well, a lot of things were, have been on Zoom where I've been able to meet individually with some of the members, right, of the council. And they're able to like look through the stuff and help me do some of that analysis. Um, and then the guiding principles that I use are OCAP, which is Ownership, Control, Access and Possession um, from the First Nations Information Governance Center and Two-Eyed Seeing, which is another, um, I guess the Dalana School considers it a theory, um, but it's essentially more of a framework where um, it was initially developed by Albert and Rudina Marshall, um, Mi'kmaq from Nova Scotia. And they talk about how um, initially it was done in ecological sciences or biological sciences, and they use two eyed seeing so that one eye uses the strength of indigenous teachings and indigenous worldview and the other eye is like a western worldview right so it's looking at something um, and being able to use the strengths of both okay so the theory itself that they gave me right so labeling theory so it's essentially saying that somebody would receive a label from society and then that becomes your deviant from the norm right so um, and when you receive this label, a lot of times associated with it is stigma and shame. Now, um, you can either go two ways if you receive this label, right? And you, and you feel the stigma and shame. You can either take it on as a self-concept, like you can take this label on and, and accept it and um, sort of make it as a self-fulfilling prophecy. And then, or you can go the other way, which is to resist this label, right? Um, even though, despite the stigma and the shame. So when I was explaining this to the Annie Kobe Jigen Council, um, a lot of them like talked about how this label from society is not necessarily a label from indigenous communities, right? It's generally from the more um, settler communities that would um, label the indigenous women, right? As being something because they weren't 
conforming to what the societal norm was, right, essentially. Um, and then that's when they were saying that that is just actually just a pinpoint in time. So if you're looking at somebody who may have had um, interactions with CAS, for example, right, that essentially is a pinpoint in time too, where they're able to um, get some sort of help or some treatment and they're able to continue that story essentially, right? And it's no longer, um, that label may not necessarily apply nor be applicable to begin with. So I know it's fairly, it's a fairly, I don't know what the word is, academic theory, I think, but I think we were able to talk about it and discuss it in a way where it's actually more um, applicable to Indigenous worldview, specifically Anishinaabe. So they had also asked that I go into some of the archival work. I actually went to a few summers ago prior to the pandemic. It must have been probably 2019, the summer of 2019. I went to the Manitoulin Island Historical, wait, the acronym's NISHI. So Manitoulin Island Summer Historical Institute. There we go. Um, so I was lucky enough to be invited there and they held like a little program at the Ojibwe Cultural Center in Michigan. And um, yeah, and they were, I was able to meet with a bunch of historians, um, academic and indigenous, and they talked about the different archives that I would be able to access and to find um, information. So in the meantime, I've been sort of going into these archives, looking things very specifically for Red Rock First Nation. And as I was showing you that photo earlier about the Jesuit church, so the Jesuits, they kept like pretty, um, I don't want to say it's not accurate because it's from their perspective, right? But uh, they kept pretty detailed um, journals and accounts of their lives in the different places, right? Including Red Rock First Nation. So I was able to go through these and comb through them um, and look at some of the historical labels that applied. Um, this one here, like uh, we all know Johnny McDonald, former prime minister. This one is in general for everybody in Canada and what is now known as Canada. And um, so this one is taken right from their departmental report. And he has, has said that when the school is on the reserve, the child lives with its parents who are savages. He is surrounded by savages. And though he may learn to read and write, his habits and training and mode of thought are still Indian. He is simply a savage who can read or write. It has been strongly pressed on myself as the head of the department. The Indian children should be withdrawn as much as possible from the parental influence. And the only way to do that would be to put them in central training industrial schools where they acquire the habits and modes and thoughts of white men. So this is the precursor to um, residential school. Um, I say school in quotes because um, we all know that they're not, they weren't schools, but. Um, so yeah, so this is like what all of these things are based on was this belief that of this label of being savages when essentially we were just labeled differently um, and deviant from the societal norm. Um, and then specifically with Red Rock First Nation, like even looking at the Jesuits, Jesuit records, a lot of them talk about how we loved our children too much. Um, we spoiled our children. We didn't allow our children to cry. Um, yeah, so at that point, like even our love for our children was, were, was weaponized against us, right? So they used that as a way for these children to be taken to, to these industrial training schools. Um, so yeah, those are a lot of the the labels that came out of that. Um, the contemporary labels that came out of the research after talking with the women um, weren't that different um, from what was in historical labels that were placed on by um, the colonial settlers. Now, the main theme that came out of this was the fear of being labeled a bad mother, right? So everybody talked about this word, or these two words, bad mother. Um, I interviewed I think in total, I ended up with 13 mothers at the end. It was, I was reaching for 10 because that's saturation when you're doing research, but um, I had a few that rolled in afterwards and they all mentioned they did not want to be known as a bad mother. So if you're looking at that, I guess that's the, the label within the theory. Um, and then according to the Annie Kobijigan, um, they question like, well, what is a bad mother, right? Um, is it a bad the bad mother perspective is coming from those that do not generally probably don't belong in the indigenous communities. So a lot of the mothers did talk about like fear of CAS involvement, even from birth. Some of them talked about um, uh, not necessarily birth alert stories, but like shortly after birth where they had workers come into their house and um, want to look to see what was happening in the home. 
And then that's stressful itself because it opens up a file, right? And all of that. Um, and then even to have it closed afterwards, it's still something that exists um, after. And then there was a lot of talk about judgment from healthcare providers, um, both um, ex like explicitly, like they'll come out and say things uh, judgmentally to the parents, but also um, like little looks or changes in um, demeanor or um, not necessarily like spoken judgment, but they could feel the change of the healthcare provider at that time. Um, the lack of services, uh, some of the mothers talked about how they were, um, there was just no services available in the communities that they live in. Some of the, like I should also say that some of the mothers I spoke to, I'd say about 60% of the mothers lived in the community of Red Rock First Nation and about 40% of the mothers lived in other areas across Canada um, in different provinces as well. Now, a lot of them talked about how there was no services in the community and particularly those who were, were within those um, adoption roles, right? Because they felt like they weren't necessarily receiving the services that they required for the children that they had in their homes from adoption. Um, but then a lot of mothers talked about avoidance of services. Uh, avoidance of services. So this one was more along the lines of, because they were fearful of receiving this judgment of being labeled a bad mother, a lot of times they didn't necessarily access the services that they wanted to, or um, would have been helpful to them and their family because um, particularly those that use substances, for example, right? They weren't necessarily, they know that they required the help, but they also didn't want to have their children apprehended. So that was another, an example of why they may have avoided these services to avoid these labels. Okay, so now that I've done, like went through these um, really deficit-based um, applications and labels that we talked about, um, what I really wanted to do, and particularly with the Annie Kobijigan Council, was to turn this around to like strength-based approaches, right? Because like, if you look back at this, um, we wanna know why people go down that resistance and, um, that resistance pathway. And a lot of it had to do um, with these strength-based approaches, right? Because not like mothers did talk about these deficit-based labels or these um, that they experienced, but a lot of them did talk about those that uh, were very strength-based. Now, the FNIGC, the First Nations Information Governance Center, so they recently published a court report. It was actually done in 2020 when they did it, but they just uploaded it into the web, the website, I think in 2021. And they have this one report, it's called Strengths-Based Approaches to Indigenous Research and the Development of Wellbeing Indicators. Sorry. And in this report, like they quote, and they talk about what the differences between deficit-based and strength-based. So in recent years, researchers working to understand and support mental health, where this initially came from, the mental health field, have taken important steps to move the focus of the field from what has been described as deficit-based focus to one that is more strength-based. Deficit-based models of mental health focus on what is wrong with a person and how solving that problem can lead to greater mental health. In contrast, Strength-based approaches focus on identifying and supporting the various strengths, motivations, ways of thinking and behaving, as well as the protective factors within the person or the environment that support people in their journeys toward well-being. So this was something that, like I said, the Annie Kobe Council really wanted to highlight. Um, the um, community itself, like my community partners, the community and wellness program, and they also talked about how we wanted to highlight the strengths of the community as opposed to a lot of the research is deficit based like even when i'm writing i'm at the stage right now where i'm writing the dissertation and typically an, an academic dissertation or thesis follows like a very formulaic way of talking about things including your um literature review so your literature review is looking at all of the things that um have exist already on your topic and you can take a look at that. And it is mostly probably like 98% deficit based. So um, a lot of it is done by non-Indigenous researchers, but now that we have more Indigenous researchers in the field, it's starting to change. And a lot of us are wanting to focus on more of these strength-based um, strength based approaches. Okay, 
So the methodology. So as we talked about, so I had this community-based participatory research um, with the Anaco Beijing Council. So they're my main one that helped me, um, that participate in the research and they helped me we'll go through everything and um, yeah, ensure that it adheres to initial-based protocols. Mainly to adapting to COVID-19 as been in the theme and um, the sharing circle that we had prior to this, right? So, um, and some of you may or not be uh, familiar with Anishinaabe relational protocol, which is um, if I'm going to like for the Anico Beijing Council, for example, um, I approach them prior to um, the pandemic. So that was helpful. So I was able to follow protocol and offer the gift of tobacco. Um, and the gift, I gave them blankets, right, to um, help me with this research. So that's something that we do relation, a relationship to establish relationship, although we did have an existing relationship, but I also wanted to be able to show respect um, because they are giving me their knowledge and they are giving me their teachings. Um, so I would like to give something to them in return. However, when it came to actually talking to the moms and the parents and the caregivers, um, it became a little bit more um, tricky because of COVID-19 protocols. So I obviously I didn't wanna go into the community because like I said, I live in Neving, which is just outside um, of Thunder Bay. And I didn't wanna bring anything into the community of 300 members because there were particular points where they were in complete lockdown. So a lot of the times it was Zoom-based interviews and then things had opened up last summer when I started doing this. And then I would offer the participants, potential participants, um, the option of doing it on Zoom or to be able to do it like walking um, outdoors or whatever. And uh, only one mother actually uh, wanted to go out and walk outdoors and the rest were all done on Zoom because of that um, option that was available to them. I know like a lot of us are Zoomed out, um, but I feel like at the time, I think it's a lot easier <laughs> for those with younger kids to be able to just hop on the computer and uh, chat with me for a little bit. Um, and then when it came to things like uh, feasting. So typically we would offer food uh, with that. And so it's oftentimes like with the Anico Bijik and Council, we will meet on Zoom, but I will like send somebody <laughs> into Nipigan and pick up something from their local Tim Hortons. And then they will like drop it off, like do porch drop offs essentially so that we could sit and I'm able to um, talk to them and offer them food or offer them like tea um, while we're talking, right? Um, there's a place here called Tea Horse here in Thunder Bay too that's um, owned by an Indigenous woman who will send tea to them if I need it. And yeah, so yeah, it's just like working within those adaptations that you had all talked about um, during the sharing circle, which also apply to this too. So, and as I mentioned earlier, conversation methods. So Kathy Obsalon, she is from Flying Post First Nation, and um, she published a book called Can Dasa Win? Um, How We Come to Know in 2011. And she talks about, I think it's about her PhD research in that too, but she talks about this conversational method where you're not, you're not necessarily going in with the standard set of questions. You are just um, letting things flow. I did have some conversational prompts just because um, some, of the, some of the caregivers I even though we're from the same community, like I said, they didn't necessarily grow up in the community. Um, they grew up in other places. So I knew, I know of them. I know their family, but I didn't know have a relationship established with them. So for those ones, it was um, these prompts actually helped uh, in a way where I was able to talk about um, who we were, what, what kind of the children that we have. We were able to share stories in that way, right? And establish a level of comfortability. Um, and then we had the story work, right? So uh, I've been using Kathy Hobson and I've been using Leanne Simpson because they are also Anishinaabe scholars. I wanted to be very, uh, I was very particular with trying to use Anishinaabe scholars because um, to sort of counteract this pan indigeneity uh, that they have in academia where essentially if some of the research when you do like literature reviews, a lot of it's very broad. A lot of it's indigenous groups. So that includes like First Nations, Métis and Inuit. And then, um, and then it like filters down from there. Like you can find some Anishinaabe specific, um, but then it's not very often that you find very community specific. And like how it said at the beginning, um, my teaching is like where thing is, things are very specific to the area and the land that you live on and where you come from. 
So that's why I was very um, particular with who I'm using to support this work in a way. So, and because of that, we have like Paul Cormier and Lana Ray. They are two uh, indigenous scholars or First Nation scholars uh, from my community, Red Rock First Nation. And they are both at Lakehead University as well. So they use story work, particularly in this one that I have here in the references 2018. They talk about um, the drum as a learning process. And they tell stories about their connection to that as well. Um, yeah, so essentially that's where the name came from too, the We Are Stories Not Labels, to like we're tying it back to say that um, uh, it's not just this pinpoint in time and everybody's life is a story. Okay, so these strength-based themes that emerged from talking with these caregivers. Okay. Hey everyone. <laughs> oh, do you have a question? Oh, no. Um, okay. So I have a photo here. I'm using a lot of photos on my own. Um, so these are my two kids here, Noden and Wasea, on, on the right here. And this is at our community powwow, Pogwinistang traditional gathering. It's the third weekend of July. And uh, yeah, this was obviously it's a number of years back because right now they are ages 11 and nine. But uh, this was one of the last few times. Like I know they, they look so much different now, but this was prior to pandemic when we were still we were able to um, have gatherings of that size. Um, so yeah, I chose this picture here because one of the quotes that came out of talking with these moms and these uh, caregivers was that uh, a participant had said, what I found was really profound, was said, I remind myself that I've inherited intergenerational strength and not just intergenerational trauma. Because that's, all, that's what we hear about a lot. And the same mom had actually talked about how she didn't necessarily want it to be called resilient anymore, right? Because resilient meant that things had, she had had to adapt to things in a way um, because of these traumas, right? Or because of the things that had happened to her, where she wanted to not necessarily be labeled as resilient, but be labeled, you have the opportunity to be labeled as vulnerable, the opportunity to be labeled as softer, right? Um, so yeah, that was like that unique perspective that I thought was uh, actually pretty cool that came out of this because, um, yeah, to me, like the term resilient is like a strength-based term, right? Like I am like, I, like I have a shirt that says strong, what does it say? Strong, resilient, indigenous, I think, something along those lines, right? But to them, in this like particular participant where they felt as though like they didn't necessarily wanted to be called that anymore. And um and then they pointed this out too, where they had said that that's what they do when they have a, a, like a lot of these thoughts about like, what am I doing? Um, I don't know what I'm doing as a parent. Um, <laughs> these like the things that we all question about when we have children, right? And uh, that's, what she, that's what she does in response is that she reminds herself that she has this intergenerational strength that she's also inherited and has blood memory um, from those ancestors, those any kill beach again that, um, that I showed you that are mine. Okay, so, and then the ones that we actually pulled out with the Anniko Bijigan Council are these five here. A lot of them, like, they essentially, there was a lot within the interviews and they were Zoom-based, which was helpful because I was able to establish the um, closed captioning that this one also has. And like you were mentioning, it's not actually that accurate sometimes, but um, so I was able to uh, take that de-identified data because it didn't, like I was mentioning, it's a very small community as well. So as part of your re research ethics, you don't want to have anybody to be identified, particularly in a community of only 300 people. So I have to like go through these transcripts before sharing them with the Anico Bijan Council to remove any identifiers so that we were able to look at the data so that it wasn't um, identifiable, like things like people's names, obviously, even sometimes like number of children, because then some, because it's so small, some people will be like, oh, I know who has like, eight kids, for example. But um, yeah, so it was going through that. And then this is essentially the five that we landed on. So there was a wealth of material from these 13 people. And uh, a lot of them slipped into these themes that we were able to establish. Um, there is software. So there's a software called InVivo and it's developed so that you can create these themes and like qualitative research. Um, and I was able to run it through that. However, like I felt like we go, when we went back to the old fashioned way of just like applying like sticky, um, like, what do we have, 3M post-it notes, right? 
and um, be able to like identify them by color while working with the, the Antico Bijigan Council and to sort them into these different themes. Okay. And we, we actually did it virtually at one point too. So as you see here in your, um, where um, Cindy had asked you to do those little virtual post-it notes. So we also did that as well at one point too. Okay. So we have kinship networks, advocacy, land-based learning, food sovereignty, and reclamation of tradition. So these are all the strengths that all of these caregivers identified. And then the Anaco Bijigan Council helped me um, create that overarching theme. Okay. So kinship networks. So um, I just put quotes on all of these uh, slides that came like came from the research participants. Um, and then of course I have pictures, so just uh, something visually to look at. So this is Noden here um, with the uh, river that's nearby here, uh, the Pigeon River. And he's just sort of reflecting with kin, right? And for especially in my teaching, the Ojibwe teaching of kin is not just with human relations. It's also your relationship with land and your relationship with non-human um, like animals and uh, birds and fish and all of the living things, right? Um, water. So that's why I chose this picture because he's interacting with his kin water. Okay. And so the quote that I, for this one that I chose what says that my cousins and aunties were there with me in the delivery room. Oh, I didn't even read that properly. My cousins and aunties were there in the delivery room with me. And that really gave me strength. I was really lonely when I was only allowed two people in the room with my younger children. So this particular caregiver and mother um, talked about how she had children over a span of time. So she had an older, um, an older child, right? And at this, I guess, they must have been born in the early 2000s, late 90s, right? This older child. And at this time, she told the story about how she was able to have aunties and cousins. And she said she had up to 10 people in the delivery room with her. And she did talk about um, the judgment received by some of the healthcare providers for having those people in the delivery room with her. Um, but to her, it was still that source of strength. She was able to... Um, uh, labor, right? Labor with that family around her and to be able to have ceremony involved. Although at that time you weren't allowed to do things like smudging in the, um, in the hospital rooms or anything like that, but family was there to be able to do that. And then in contrast, when she had uh, children a, a little later in life, she was uh, only allowed the two people limit of what it is in the room. And now it's even less because of COVID-19, right? So um, she talked about that loneliness that she felt because this kinship network that she had established and her family and her aunties and cousins um, weren't available to her at that time. So this highlights the importance about how the kinship ne networks provide strength to a lot of these um, caregivers that we talked about. So it wasn't just this story. A lot of people talked about like the, the relationships with their own parents um, helping out, um, particularly women who were raising children on their own, um, all had like a support network to be able to help them, all within the community. There was a contrast, though, to those who didn't live within the community, for example, they had to create these kinship networks in their urban centers or their rural centers that they lived in off community. But they were, they did have the opportunity to create these networks in these centers. And then, um, oh, it's not going to work right now. There we go. Okay. Advocacy. This was another strength-based approach that came out of this. So this one here, um, this is a picture of my son here because he grows his hair, right? So he grows his hair out. And um, a lot of times I have to advocate for him because of the length of his hair, right? Sometimes um, it's not just, and it's not just other children, right? A lot of times I have to talk about what it means to have this, um, to have his hair um, at this length, right? To other adults. Um, yeah, so that's the advocacy piece that I play. And that was some of the stories that I was able to share back with some of my participants. Um, but for this quote here, they had said that I feel like I was better able to speak up after I became a mother. I knew I had to learn to advocate for my child in their culture. So this particular participant too, had talked about how, um, being an Indigenous person, sometimes you are not necessarily one to speak up because like, because of the colonial policies and everything that existed in residential schools and our family networks and that sort of thing, um, Indian day schools, you are sort of 
conditioned not to question authority, essentially, right? So this mother had talked about how she was conditioned to do that in that way. But when she had her own children, she better felt like she was able, she had the strength to be able to speak up after um, on behalf of herself, but also on behalf of her children. It became more important to her to be able to um, advocate for herself and her children at that point. So I thought that was also illustrative of this um, strength that occurs, right? Um, once somebody becomes a caregiver to children. Land-based learning. So this one was a very particular one for COVID-19 because as we all know, um, the, the schools had uh, shut down a number of times. Um, and then a lot of the mothers talked about their response to that. So this is noted here. Um, uh, we also do some home-based learning here. So this is, was a porcupine that we were able to, uh, that was gifted to us actually, so that we could process it. So we actually, I've never processed a porcupine because I've been in Toronto for the last 15 years. I've had quills given to me and I've shared quills, but I've never actually done that. So this is something that Noden and Wasay and I were able to learn together, um, thanks to this gifted porcupine. Um, and then a lot of the other like participants had talked about how in response to COVID-19, they were able to draw on these land-based learning um, that they were learning um, together, essentially, right? So this one mother had said, I told my kids' teachers that I didn't have the internet to have them on the online learning all day during the pandemic, that's my words, and they were supportive. Instead, I took the kids outside to learn how to snare rabbits. So this particular mother, like, like it's illustrated in this quote, I talked about how she didn't, she had the internet, it just wasn't strong enough to be able to um, have their children sit and do the online learning each day. So she arranged a deal to have um, them to do paper-based work, and then she would drive the paper up to the school. But then most of the time they would finish that in the mornings, and then they would be able to go out on the land and learn together about like how to snare rabbits. So that was another adaptation essentially, and something that um, they were able to reach back into their traditions and their teachings to be able to apply in this, um, in this COVID-19 um, response, I don't know, but okay, food sovereignty. So this is a big one, particularly to the community, right, at this point. So I included a link to this news article. Maybe I'll click over and show it to you too, because um, they actually created Mama Witch Winning, so that is at, it means at the gathering place. So it is actually a butcher shop and they just put in a moose hanger and it is located. So my reserve has a, a place called the Chalet Lodge. It was initially owned by non-Indigenous folks, but now it's been acquired by my community. And there they have things like their salmon derby and they have this fall harvest there. And now they have this place to be able to um, uh, distribute meat. Uh, butcher and distribute meat to people. So this person had said, we just got a butcher shop and moose hanger here on the res. It has been good to host the salmon derby and the fall harvest there. The kids get to learn how to respectfully use the animals and share with elders in the community. So every fall they have the fall harvest and the, the salmon derby shortly before that as well. And I think it's, that's the first weekend of September. And, um, yeah, and then they have this place where they're able to gather together and they bring the moose or that they the deer, right? And they were able to bring it back and they teach the kids how to harvest and butcher it and package it. And then they distribute it to the different members of the community. So, and then here you have my two kids, Noden and Wasea. Um, this is when we were learning how to snare rabbits like pretty early on in the pandemic too. So, okay, I'm just gonna click over. I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it if it like loads up on my screen. Maybe not, there it is, okay. So here we go, Red Rock Indian Man continues to work on food sovereignty with opening of its own butcher shop. So this is the most recent article. I think this was done last December. So this is Tim or Chum Ruth, um, who has been leading this project with, in conjunction with the Indigenous Food uh, Circle as well here in Thunder Bay. So yeah, like it's a butcher place and now they have things there like the meat grinder, the smoker, commercial grade dehydrator bone saws and meat slicers to be able to help out. They have all this equipment. And the grand opening, it was held on September 30th, which was the first national day for truth and reconciliation. And then this is their um, moose hanger that they have built here. And let's see what other pictures, yeah, just pictures you have there. And that's what it looks like on the inside. And this was done by a local um, artist, uh, 
trying to think about Hannah Blakely. Hannah Blakely did this art here for the butcher shop too. Okay, I'm gonna go back to my presentation. Okay, so there, that, so that's how food sovereignty actually made that in. And it was definitely a strength because a lot of like, particularly the elders in the community really have this knowledge that they were holding and they wanted to be able to um, pass it on to the younger people within the community. And now they have the space to be able to do that. Um, and because of the outdoor space that it is, they were able to do it within the September, right? And I believe they, they, they had a power on October 1st too. So um, with following protocols and stuff like that, we were able to do a little bit of in-person work at that time. Okay. And then this last one, reclamation of tradition was fairly wide. So this one here, I just took a picture. I'm actually working on that right now. These are split toe moccasins that um, I think somebody from Thunder Bay had mentioned to how they are putting on a virtual moccasin making group. So my community is also doing this virtual moccasin making um, with um, Shannon, Gust Shannon Gustafson. So she's been helping us, showing us how to do these split toe moccasins. It's been difficult for me, but this is the, the stage that I brought, I've reached thus far. I have it this evening as well, and it'll be the last one to finish it up. And um, yeah, so this is uh, just what I put in through in here for this reclamation of tradition um, to illustrate, provide a visual representation. But the quote here for this one I, I chose was that, I'm happy that our community has so many traditional activities, the powwow regalia making full moon ceremony. I'm learning along with my children because my parents didn't get to teach me. So this one here teaches, touches a little bit too on the theme of, um, um, of that interruption of knowledge sharing, right? Because of all of those policies that occurred uh, residential school and in day school and all um, the 60 scoop, millennial scoop and all of that, right? So um, this one sort of touches on that piece where their parents didn't necessarily, may not have wanted to teach them, or may like as a protective factor, or they just weren't around or didn't know about it at that point either, right? So um, yeah, so this one talked about how they were able to learn this piece from the elders that's in the community and from knowledge keepers like Shannon Gustafson to um, be able to pass that on to their own families and their children in that way. So this one here was a fairly broad one because like I said, like they mentioned this one particular person mentioned like the powwow, we're regularly making full moon ceremony, but then other mothers had talked about things like um, cedar baths that was mentioned earlier and moss bags that was mentioned earlier. Um, yeah, there was like a whole um, dream catchers. And then there was also the, the sling, like the baby swing that was made out of like a sheet, right? And um, like between the two trees. So a lot of like moms have talked about um, that these things have survived essentially right and it wasn't necessarily taught by certain people but now they're able to reclaim these teachings and learn them from very various places like the friendship centers and cap ccpmp and it's they talked about how it's very important to them to be able to access this type of um, knowledge so i think that's what i have for the strength base so i was talking earlier about how all of this piece is actually, and I was writing it all up, and that's the reason why we were talking very specifically about the strength base and how it was like very serendipitously aligned with when Cindy asked me to talk, because I wrote the chapter for this textbook. Um, it's going to be called Public Health Feminisms. It's going to be published this year, and it's edited by Dr. Renee Monchalon, who is also a PhD. She was a PhD student at the Don Lona School of Public Health. Also supervised by Dr. Janet Smiley. Dr. Janet Smiley is my supervisor for my PhD and Renee was her first student that she supervised. And she now teaches at the University of Victoria. She's a Métis scholar um, from the Fort Erie area. Now, um, all the chapters will be written by self-identified Black, Indigenous, people of color, women, and it will have an intersectionality lens. So intersectionality is a theory created by Kimberly Crenshaw a black woman in the United States who talks about like how different identities intersect. So for example, myself, I would be like an indigenous woman, those two intersect as well as a mother, um, my sexuality and gender and all that would intersect together. So that is a good, good program. I'm just reading the chat right now, but yeah. So yeah, that will be coming down if you're interested in looking at that. And I just wanted to say, um, miigwech, 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 miigwech for having, there's my contact information. Please contact me because I love hearing from everybody. 
Um, like <laughs> I love hearing from everybody. I love everything. So that's why I was kind of hesitant to be able to judge the good minds contest because I like not very discerning because I really like people, <laughs> people and things and everything's funny to me. So yeah, like, I don't know how I'll, I'll have to come up with some sort of judging mechanism, but here are the references uh, that I mentioned, like Kathy Obsalon's book, um, Paul and Lana's um, article that they have, F and IGC, and then all of Leanne Simpson's books that I'd been using as well. Um, and she has newer ones too. Okay, so that is the end of that formal presentation. So I'm hoping there are some questions um, that I'm gonna, I can answer. I'm going to stop sharing my screen at this point. So I can see everybody's faces again. Okay. And go to gallery. All right. Okay. So I can see you all again. <laughs> Miigwech. Uh, any questions for any? Or does anybody want to share? Any reflections on that? Everybody's quiet. We're still <laughs> keeping it all in. <laughs> Thanks, Miranda. That was awesome. Um, I love the pictures, and I was just wondering how did you, were you the keeper of those older pictures of your family, or did you collect them from from different um, family? Yeah, um, they were from initially from my grandmother so my granny the one picture I showed her, she was in her regalia um, with her fan so they the pictures initially belonged to her but then I sort of inherited those pictures after she passed on um, I'm very picture-based <laughs> person um, so like I think like Instagram is my favorite mode of communication I think because I like to communicate in um, visual visual representations I think so yeah she knew that I was really I really like the pictures and she was able to hand down those photos to me. So, but so now I do, they're now in my possession, but they initially came from her. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna read the chat here. Any other questions or comments for Miranda? Yes, there's some, some gratitude coming in from the chat for you, Miranda. Mm -hmm. Yeah. like. I'm, I'm similar, Marianne, to like, I had talked about how even some of the mothers had talked about how they didn't necessarily learn either. Um, with my family, like my parent, my grandparents, my dad's side of the family were fluent Anishinaabe Muin speakers, um, but they didn't pass it on, right? Because that's something that they, um, like, my grandfather had even said that that was like, they, he was taught that that was the language of the devil, right? So, and they wanted to protect like their children from internal damnation, right? So that's something that they felt was something that they wanted to protect their children from. But at the same time, so now we're like, we're relearning, trying to relearn this national bame win. And um, well, they had two fluent speakers in their home, right? So, but that was an example of how, um, it wasn't necessarily passed down at that point and they didn't learn it from them, but, but thankfully there are speakers who kept that alive, right? And were able to learn from them in different forums. And Miranda, what did you find most surprising from your, your conversations with the women and your research? Mm -hmm. Um, I think, like I'd mentioned earlier about how like the resiliency thing, right? Like I had said where I felt like to me, like in my definition of things, resiliency is something that um, I'm proud of, I guess, in a sense where I felt like some of the, like some, one of the mothers in particular felt as though like she didn't want to be called resilient anymore. And I think there's actually a book coming out. I don't know if it's a book or I'm not sure what it's going to be, but it's called Don't Call Me Resilient. And it's about that, um, it's about that topic itself, in itself, right? About how they want, I'm not sure if this mother had interactions with this book already or what, but um, yeah, it was about, they wanted the opportunity to remain vulnerable, like somebody who was able to, who doesn't necessarily have this trauma in their life, right? They're able to remain in a sense where they don't have to be called resilient. They don't have to be congratulated for all of the, 
tough things that they had went through, right? Where they felt um, they should also be congratulated for the strength that they had too. And resiliency doesn't necessarily, um, resiliency is a result of sometimes of bad things, I guess, but. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that was like a new perspective, I think that generally came from this. That's really been like, I've been really thinking about, <laughs> I'm really processing it and yeah, thinking about how, yeah, different people think about these different labels, I guess, essentially, but. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that is really interesting perspective on it. And that mm -hmm. book will be very interesting. Yeah, yeah. I'll have to find out more about it. I just came across it actually, because I've been thinking about this <laughs> since mm -hmm. that, like since that conversation I've had, right? I was like, oh, that's kind of unique. But yeah, so mm -hmm. Great. I, it, but I guess that's the good part about talking with all these different perspectives. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions? I'm just seeing everybody's gratitude on the chat. Well, um, shall we wrap, wrap this up and I can stop the recording and then perhaps we could do our little giveaways and as a way to uh, end our, our time together. Does that, does that feel right? I, unless there's somebody else who wanted to say something. I don't want to cut anybody off. Um, okay. Thank you, Randa. And um, so I'll, uh, I'll end the recording now, and, but we'll continue with, the, um, uh, with our, our wrapping up here.